Hello, I'm Sarah Marzi. Welcome to my project, Songs of Salem, 1692. I'm a vocal performance major, soon to be a dual degree with music composition. I love anything opera and classical music, and I've been taking voice lessons since the fourth grade. I've loved singing and I've loved vocal music, so it was such a treat to spend this summer writing seven songs about the Salem Witch Trials. It's a song cycle for four singers and one pianist. It's based on the Ginny Lo Connors book of poetry called Toward the Hanging Tree, Poems of Salem Village. Now, a song cycle is a collection of songs in the Western classical canon that deal with a common theme, poets, um, other things like that. A great example is Franz Schubert's Dichte Liebe, which is about love, um, as many songs in the Western classical canon are. This book I found in the summer before my freshman year, and I just fell in love. I remember sitting in the stacks in the poetry section, which was regrettably quite small, but I found this book by a poet who was in Connecticut, maybe basically 20 minutes away from my house, and I said, wow, this is amazing poetry. How could I have not heard about this before? So I knew that I just needed to turn it into music and bring this poetry to more people. My project had the goal of learning more about my compositional process. I only started learning about composing in my sophomore year, and since then my musical sense has been growing, but the only way to really practice that is through doing, and I needed the support of a program like Holster Scholars to be able to do that. I was able to identify my strengths and my blind spots, and I've solidified that composing is a really important part of who I am as an artist, and also where I want to go with my career in the future. The characters in the story are quite familiar because of Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible. A lot of people know about it or they've seen the movie. Um, so I won't really go into that because it's, uh, it's pretty solidified in our, in our canon. However, I will go over Abigail Williams, whose song I will show you later. She's a 13-year-old girl, and she is the um, uh, niece of Reverend Samuel Paris. And she accuses Tituba of witchcraft. So to illustrate a bit about the compositional process, I want to show you one song. This is the first song that I actually wrote maybe fifth in the, in the cycle. I broke it up quite a bit. Um, it's called Abigail Summons the Future. In this poem, Abigail is doing this basically harmless ritual where she takes an egg with all of her friends and they drop it into a glass of water and they look to see what the yolk will turn out to be and that will be their future husband. Well, because of course, it's 1692 in Massachusetts, Puritan New England. What else is there to do for women than get married and have children?
thank you so much for watching that. That was myself singing and my wonderful accompanist, Alan Conway, on piano. Now, when we talk about the composition process, a lot of people often think about the image of Beethoven hunched over the piano, writing furiously, probably drinking just as furiously. Um, while there is some level of frustration involved with composing, because it is such a vulnerable emotional, emotional process, I found that once I had a compositional technique and a list of steps that I knew I needed to go through, composition got a lot easier by the end of the summer, and I was having a lot less frustrated moments. To start off all of my composing, I needed to do a lot of text study for meaning before I even thought about the music or what even voice part the character would be. So for Abigail's poem, which you just heard, there were a lot of dualities and contrasts present. When I first noticed the poem, I, I thought about themes of dark versus light, secrecy versus openness, and perhaps the biggest one, predestination versus change. And contrasts are important in music because they deal with things like loud and soft, fast and slow, minor and major, staccato or really separated notes versus legato or really smooth and connected notes. I'm sure you could hear quite a bit of that in this song. And contrast is what really makes music exciting. If you're a fan of um, like rock or popular music when that like beat drop happens, that's an example of contrast really doing its job. Now, when I was working with Abigail's character, I was really struggling at first to connect with her. I mean, she's this 14 year old girl who is causing the deaths of her neighbors and friends and family, and that seems so far removed. But when I thought about how trapped she was with this idea of, you know, predestination and, you know, she has to marry in a couple years, that fear can really set in, and that is what propels the action and the music forward. So this is an example of the kind of text study I would do for the technical aspects. Um, you can see the straight up lines are the, are the stresses of words and the little curves are the unstresses. And this pattern of stresses and unstresses or rises and fall in language lends itself to musical rhythm and also pitch of a melody. This is what makes a song sound more natural. Next, I don't know if you can see this quite well, but I just have um, the vocal line um, etched out with just rhythms. And this gives me an idea of the momentum and the rhythm of the song. Next in the process, I go to Finale, which is a music notation software I use on my computer. I learned that it's not my favorite this summer, but I'll be looking more into different programs in the future. So this is just a rough draft of what the melody looked like. I kept basically the same rhythm and just added pitches that I thought sounded right. And once I sang them, it sounded like a good melody. After I had the vocal melody, I began sketching back to the drawing board all the piano parts. This, that bum, 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 bum. That melody is written right here. And that's what you just heard in the opening and the closing of the piano part for that song. I also do a little bit more abstract piano sketching as well. I found a couple of chords that I called the magic chords because they were super mysterious and had lots of hidden dissonances in them. I also found this rhythm for the piano, that boom chick, boom chick. That seemed to suggest a dance, which was perfect for a 13-year-old girl character. I also wanted the key structure of the piece to change key quite quickly. It goes from F sharp to G and then eventually to F sharp major at the end. And this all helps the character feel more unstable because the keys are changing quite frequently. This was a choice I made purposefully. In the piano sketch, I often throw out a lot of the ideas I'm using. That first draft is only like maybe a third usable, but something I did find was these two repeated notes that make up a minor third interval. It goes do, la, that interval. And I thought that sounded quite mysterious. And I used that later on, you can see in the red, as that minor third motif in the piano that creates a sense of 
uh, time passing or something a little mysterious lurking. And then I also use those magic chords on the word magic. Um, <laughs> a little obvious, but I think it worked quite well. Now I'll talk a little bit more about the compositional process. Now I took that original theme, that bum 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 bum, and at the end, I actually turned it from a major tonality, from sounding quite happy using the major scale, to the minor tonality using the minor scale by just changing a few notes. And that made it um, a lot more mysterious and sad sounding. Some other notable compositional techniques I used included musical onomatopoeia. Now, onomatopoeia in language is when we use words like crash, bang, splash, that actually sound like the thing they're describing. On the words shower of sparks, I use these descending little trills that sound like a shower of sparks. And I also use the improvisatory element of the evil laugh slash scream, which was such a fun acting moment for me personally. And I wanted anybody else who wanted to sing this after me to have that moment. So of course, I just had to include it. It comes as a turning point for the character. And it was just super fun. Had to include it. Now, if you want to find more about um, Songs of Salem or listen to the six other recordings, um, you can search on YouTube or SoundCloud for Sarah Marzi Songs of Salem. By the time you're watching this, those recordings will be posted, as well as the Q&A with myself and the poet, Jenny Lo Connors. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much to the Holster program, Mr. and Mrs. Holster, and the honors and the honors program. I really appreciated this summer of doing what I love. I really got a sense of accomplishment from finishing these seven songs, and I'm so lucky I get to share them with all of you. Thank you so much to Dr. Mascardelli for helping me with this proposal and the project from its birth to its finish. I have loved working with him, and he's helped me so much with clarity in my project and the proposal. Thank you so much to Dr. Fuchs my wonderful mentor who writes the most amazing music and gives the best advice. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank my wonderful poet, Jenny Lo Connors. Without her work, this would have never been possible. And I'm so lucky she let me use her poetry. It's truly amazing. I'd also like to thank my professors, um, Dr. Ruth Fairbanks and Dr. Darcy Dennigan. They helped me with the poetry side of things and help me get a better grasp on what I can do with the poetry. Finally, I'd like to thank Alan Conway, the king of the keys, who played piano on all of these and served as partially my editor for a lot of the piano parts because he is the most masterful piano player in all of UConn. Thank you so much. Have a great day.